Okay, so let me yeah, start the final part of my lecture. So, ah, so I think the, the uh, lecture is going uh, much more slowly than I had expected. Yeah, but maybe it's better yeah, to, uh, for you to follow uh, as much as possible. Yeah. So let me uh, very briefly introduce what the declarative semantics of this language looks like. So, so basically, is the purpose of the declarative semantics or the purpose of the a Hedora program is to define the constraints of a family on our trajectories. So, uh, uh, actually, Hedora comes with some local variable, but uh, so let us be let us focus on some uh, set of global variables, which are the family of variables x. And each x is a function of over time. So maybe this x bar of t is what you want to describe. And so, and the declarative semantics, yeah, yeah, <coughs> is something like this. Yeah, see, uh, some trajectory um, satisfies the specification, yeah, uh, <coughs> written as a Hydra program. And the specification comes with two parts. One is the partially ordered set of constraints. So the so this RS the rules uh, the rule part um, determine the uh, um, priority or hierarchy of uh, rules, and the, and DS is just a set of rules. So 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 this is a uh, in the slide it's so uh, says the first attempt, but maybe uh, I think we don't have to be more detailed about the. Uh, <coughs> Uh, which uh, reflects the semantics of the recent Hydra. So maybe uh, let me skip um, something not very important, and, uh, and but let us focus on the core part of the declarative semantics. And so, th th so this slide uh, is the single slide which describes the essence of the Hydra program. But uh, maybe. Yeah, there are some yeah, um, minor part, but, but so but anyway, the Hydra program uh, and the um, some set of constraints, uh, which um, um, so actually the Hydra program is a basically a set of partially unitary set of constraints, but uh, the what is a bit complicated is that. Uh, something like um, so. Actually, uh, in the case of sortus wave, um, if the variable function reaches ten, then the value of uh, f um, is reset to zero. So, and uh, this is a sort of a simple uh, case. But but the Hydra allows you to say something like. Um, uh, if the value of x, value of f, um, reaches ten, then uh, something uh, happens uh, persistently. So this means that once the value of f reaches ten, then something, uh, the s equals one, yeah, just uh, uh, it's, it it keeps existent in the constant store. So maybe we should handle this case and this case a somewhat different way. Uh, so that's why uh, the, uh, our solution uh, is not just a set of trajectories, but it is a pair of a trajectory and the history of uh, a set of constraints which have been then enabled. So I mean, uh, the, so let's. Uh, Think of the time ten or something. So at time ten, um, the set of constraints uh, which can be effective uh, uh, cannot be determined uh, just by the current status, uh, because maybe uh, in the past something happened, at, uh, and some event in the past may release or generate some new constraint. So. Uh, Actually, the history should record what happened in the past. Uh, so that's why we have 
we take the pair of a trajectory and the history of constraints. So, but that's the uh, 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 important but minor detail of the semantics. So, actually, semantics comes in uh, four parts: number one, number two, and number three, number four. But number one and number two are rather uh, technical and not very important. So, let's focus on number three. So, number three means that. Yeah. Uh, so, let's recall that x is a uh, function over time t, and so at any time, and R s is some partially ordered structure of set of constraints. Uh, you can choose some appropriate uh, set of constraints. So for, uh, at each time, you can choose something. And then uh, and the trajectory yeah, in consideration uh, satisfies um, all constraints in the set of constraints you chose uh, at time t. So basically, uh, the trajectory satisfies set of constants you chose. So this is the first part of the number three. And the second part is more important. The second part says that, uh, suppose that uh, you have, you consider another candidate trajectory. And, and then, uh, and maybe you can uh, consider another uh, possibly more stronger constraint in this uh, in the partially ordered structure, then uh, <coughs> the, this maximality uh, condition says that there are no such rival or uh, alternative constraints x prime such that uh, x prime and x and x prime are the same uh, in the past, but and uh, this e prime is stronger than e, uh, and um, and the x prime uh, satisfies all the constraints in the uh, rival or alternative set E prime of constraints. So this means that, uh, and that the constraint you chose is uh, some maximal uh, consistent set of constraints. So this is the second part. And the third part is about the closure. Okay, so this means that, uh, okay, so, so if the, your trajectory you chose uh, satisfied some d. So suppose that yeah, you chose some rule, and that, that rule is a conditional rule uh, with, each, uh, with some condition, condition guard d, and it's an inconsequent e. And suppose that uh, your uh, trajectory satisfied this condition d at time t, and the, you have a rule says d implies e. Then uh, this consequent should be in the uh, uh, set of uh, <coughs> constraints uh, you are considering now. So this means that uh, you should take some deductive closure of uh, the, these conditional rules. So, so, so this is so actually. So at each time uh, you should compute the deductive closure. So you should uh, follow the chain of uh, conditional constraints. Uh, uh, until uh, it reaches a fixed point. So this is number three, okay, uh, which comes in three parts. And the number four says that uh, the rule uh, you chose at each t is the small, smallest satisfying uh, number one to three. So um, maybe, uh, so this means that uh, you don't have to uh, um, uh, consider uh, more constraints. But I think the number four is still a uh, uh, technical part uh, because uh, this is about uh, the second part, uh, which didn't exist in the initial constraint. So uh, maybe the number three uh, in three parts are the far, by far the most important part of the constraint. Yeah. So yeah. Interesting yeah. question. So yeah. QRT is yeah. Uh, a set of, of what of constraints yeah. of so certifications. Uh, uh, Q Q is this Q or uh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. I, I just don't understand yeah. what is uh, QRT. QRT, uh, so Q. Uh, Q is a, uh, yeah, Q is um, a set of rules, and each rule is indexed by its rule name. Uh, so, and, and, the, and also, and so Q of R is a um, set of constraints, and which make uh, 
change over time. Yeah. So yeah, so you have two arguments. So it's again a bit technical. Uh, but anyway, is this Q of R of T yeah, record what happens in the past? Yes, yes. Basically, so uh, I, mean, I think yeah, I, mean, I can explain in uh, more details offline. But I think it's better to uh, move to the next topic. Okay. So uh, actually, uh, the semantics uh, is designed so that uh, the constraints. So basic, basically, the initial idea of constraints uh, is that uh, we don't have to specify the direction of computation. Yeah, uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, if uh, uh, x equals um, y plus 1, then yeah, yeah, so if you in the framework of constraint satisfaction or constraint solving uh, programming, um, if you have this uh, constraint, then if you know x, then you know the value of y. And if you know the value of y, then uh, you know the value of x. So yeah, the computation or propagation is bidirectional. Uh, but uh, in our case, uh, we need to be able to uh, compute the trajectory. So, and and the semantics, the declarative semantics is designed, designed in, such, in such a way that the computation can be solved, mostly solved as an initial value of program of ODEs. So let's suppose this simple program. Yeah. Uh, so let's suppose that the structure of constraint is the power set of um, these three rules. So we can uh, choose any subset of these rules. But uh, we need to uh, adopt uh, as a maximally consistent subset of these rules. Okay. And the first rule says that the value of y is initially zero. And the second rule says that uh, the slope of y is one and x is constant. And the third rule says that um, if the value of y is 5, then x must be 1. So this program uh, states that uh, you don't know the value of uh, x until uh, 5 seconds uh, has passed. Yeah. So the question is that, so you know that uh, the um, value of uh, y, so, so sorry, value of x maybe 1 after uh, 5 seconds. But what is the value of um, x at time 0 or uh, maybe any time before uh, uh, 5 seconds has passed? So let's consider three possibilities. One possibility is that y, uh, you can expect that y is just <coughs> um, increasing at the constant rate. So y of t equals t is a reasonable solution. Yes, and x of t equals 1 is another reasonable solution. So, and so actually, and, and this and this satisfies all constraints at all time. So clearly, this is a solution. So let's consider there are other solutions or uh, other trajectories which satisfies the requirement in the last slide. So let's consider the second uh, alternative. So y is just uh, increasing and x equals 2, which means that uh, x is constant, but it may violate the uh, rule f at time 5. But still, uh, and the uh, y equals t, y of t equals t, x of t equals 2 satisfies all these uh, constraints before uh, time 5. And at time 5, and d and e, uh, are satisfied. <coughs> and it again satisfies all constraints after time. Oh, so after this, uh, I, I can, uh, so this is uh, t greater 5. Yeah. Oh, it again satisfies all constraints. And uh, actually, um, this is again uh, a solution because, um, so at time 5, um, um, we should consider how to extend the solution yeah, just before time five. And, so, and actually, yeah, to keep the value of x at time five yeah, is one of the reasonable yeah, way to extend the solution before time five. Okay. 
And the, the, this is another alternative. The y is the same, but the x, uh, the value of x is 2 before time 5, and it is reset to 1 at time 5. Uh, so let's consider this solution. And it satisfies all the constraints before time 5, and, and at time 5, it uh, uh, satisfies the uh, constraint d and f uh, instead of d and e. And it again satisfies all constraints after time 5. <laughs> so uh, this is another way to extend the solution uh, before time 5. Uh, so actually, um, but yeah, the set d and e and set d and f are not comparable. So and both of them are just equally uh, reasonable way of extend the uh, solution before time 5. Uh, so in our semantics, both uh, we both allow the trajectory B and trajectory C, as well as the tra trajectory A. A. So, uh, so that's how the semantics of Hydra allow the uh, uh, constraint at time 5 back to the time before uh, time 5. Okay. So actually, uh, this program cannot be computed uh, compute in the current Hydra because uh, uh, current Hydra Mm, doesn't allow you to have a variable whose value is totally unknown uh, at any time. Uh, because uh, yeah, in most um, engineering purposes, maybe uh, whenever you have some variable, then uh, it's assumed that uh, you have some information about each variable. Yeah, but in, in this case, at initial time, there's no information about variable x. So in the current our implementation, uh, mm, uh, this program cannot be computed. But in principle, uh, this is the basic um, policy of the Hydra uh, semantics. OK. Yeah. 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 So uh, why uh, satisfy the local maximum? Uh, wait, uh, the, uh, the solution B? B is not uh, OK. Does, uh, yeah. does that satisfy all uh, the constraints, no? Okay, at, at time five. At time five. Time okay, five. Satisfy uh, the okay, time five. The value of y is uh, five, and so uh, because uh, y of five is five, so this is true. So if the f is enabled, then x must be one. Uh, but uh, this, uh, but this trajectory uh, at time five uh, is. Uh, the the value of x at time five is two, so this and this are not compatible. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So why, yeah. why you say it satisfies the local? Uh, I uh, don't understand exactly what you mean by local maximality. I would say uh, local maximality so at time five. So all of them. okay. Uh, so at that uh, so this solution satisfied and d and d e at time five, but not f. Yeah, that, that's his question. Why in the end you mentioned yeah. satisfy mm. all the three solutions <coughs> a, b, c. Satisfy local maximality. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so actually, yeah. So this solution, yeah, right. Uh, satisfy d and e at time five, and this solution uh, satisfy d and f at time five. Uh, but uh, we cannot uh, uh, prefer one over the other. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. But in general, you you, yeah. you want to satisfy all constraints. Uh, satisfy and as as many as yeah, as many constants as possible. Uh, okay. Yeah. And, and when you write d, d, uh, d you do not write y of zero equal to zero. Y of zero. So this is the same as y of zero equals to zero. It's yeah. The same. It's, it's the same. Yeah. Because we don't have the always yeah temporal operator. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, let's go back to get back to the bouncing ball example. So actually, yeah. Um, the program is the same. Actually, this is an expanded form of uh, constant hierarchy. So it's essentially the same as what I showed you before. So, uh, but um, it turns out that maybe you want to uh, model a bouncing ball, maybe something like this way. Um, but uh, it turns out that there are some more implicit or hidden assumption which um, uh, allows you to uh, get uh, the desired solution. So the, the point are the following. Okay. 
So anyway, the point is that you know that so maybe so this is the x-axis here, its center. And the red line is the trajectory of an HD height, and the green lines are the um, values of the HD prime, which is the velocity. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you know that at the bouncing time, the point phase, the H, both HD and H, HD prime are uh, not differentiable. Yeah. But HD is continuous, and HD prime is not continuous. Okay. So the point is that. Uh, at this point, uh, the value of HT prime jumps, uh, so uh, it is con not continuous. But uh, but we need to have some assumption about the value of uh, HT uh, because uh, so and the assumption is that uh, the right continuity of HT and HT prime at the bouncing time must be assumed. So in particular, uh, we want to, uh, we need to assume that the ball uh, here will not to move to somewhere else. Yeah. So this is a sort of, uh, OK, um, it's, it's a sort of um, uh, frame axiom. Yeah. Maybe have you heard of this term? Yeah, maybe frame. This is a very popular term in the artificial intelligence. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Okay. And if something is not explicitly mentioned, then nothing will happen on that yeah knowledge. So maybe. So okay. So if there is no information uh, that things changes, then that thing will not change. That's the frame axiom. So actually, the world is full of frame axioms. So because we don't uh, want to say uh, something uh, doesn't change. Uh, so any news is uh, uh, something which may surprise you. Okay. So this is the principle of Fred axiom. So this is uh, uh, very important for economical purposes. Okay. So, so at the each, so, yeah, so yeah. So this means yeah. that in B, yeah. If you don't use the frame maximum, yeah. you have to add that HT yeah. is equal to zero H T minus. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if we don't have frame maximum, then yeah, we need to uh, assume add something more. Yeah, yes, yeah. Add something to yeah. Just yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so we need. We want to say at least two more things. Okay. The one thing is that ball will not move to somewhere else. Yeah. So ball will stay here. Yeah. Yeah. And and basically, uh, we implicitly uh, assume that fact uh, when the whole program mentioned the value of HT prime. So value of HT. So so if the program mentions the value of HT prime, so then uh, we assume that HT is a mostly uh, uh, differentiable, and which implies that it is mostly continuous. Yeah. So, so even if the value is not differentiable, uh, it's reasonable to assume that the value of HT is continuous. And that's one thing. And the second thing is that, uh, at, uh, OK, on left continuity, at, at the, uh, sorry, so this is about the, sorry, left continuity, the continuity from the left, OK. <coughs> and, the th and the third point is, uh, and the second point is that uh, we need to, uh, OK, um, at this time, uh, there is no uh, full derivative. So there is only the right derivative uh, at this point. So this means that um, to, um, but, and this is some discontinuous point. But we still need to solve the ODEs. Uh, after this uh, point, so uh, uh, so something strange happens here. But uh, still, we need to s be able to solve ODE from this uh, time point and this time point. So we need to have some assumption about the um, continuity from the right uh, in this zone. And so in this case, uh, we uh, assume that the right continuity uh, of this trajectory and this trajectory from the right. 
uh, not from the left. Okay. Yeah. So uh, actually, um, we have uh, we have had many many discussions about what uh, implicit uh, continuity or what frame axiom should be uh, assumed, and we uh, actually tried many many alternatives. And actually, we haven't reached any final conclusion because things are uh, too complicated. Um, but uh, in the current um, semantics of Hydra, we have implemented reasonable uh, uh, assumptions about the continuity. Uh, okay. So, but the exact semantics of the implicit continuity is very complicated, and it's beyond the scope of this talk. Okay. And the final point uh, is. That maybe let me skip the uh, first uh, example, but let me mention the second example. So the Hydra allows you to specify something like this. Yeah, the value of a is not known. It is some somewhere between 0.9 and 1.1. But yeah, this constraint says that we don't the value we don't know the value of b, but we know that uh, the Value of a has is uh, has some derivative. Then and this and this says that a is a set of all differentiable trajectories whose ranges are uh, uh, between 0.9 and 1.1. Okay. So so I think uh, this is the Hydra program, uh, and then this sort of specification uh, or model uh, could be used for. Uh, uh, as a specification, but uh, but uh, in, uh, in some sense, uh, this is uh, something which cannot be computed, in the sense that we don't have any closed form solution of this uh, uh, constraint. So in the current Hydra, uh, we don't allow uh, this as a uh, program. Uh, so in the future, we may allow this as a specification, but currently. Uh, um, we don't allow uncertainties of this form, but we do uh, uh, allow uncertainties like uh, the value of a is um, between 0 0.9 and 1.1, and the value of a is constant. So, so we allow this uh, sort of uh, um, uncertainty uh, because uh, this can be computed uh, uh, as. Uh, some using some uh, fixed parameters. Okay. And the next point is about the zero. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> so I showed uh, some example in the web header example. So let me go back. Uh, so let's um, write. Maybe I think it's better to go back to some simple example. Why? Because and so this is a basic trajectory, but let's, uh, it's something like, okay. <coughs> then let's go, uh, this way. So this means that is it, um, so, now the ball, uh, the y-axis is the height of the ball, and x-axis is the speed. So now the ball uh, just uh, reaches this origin, 0, 0. And, maybe, and at some time, the ball will yeah, yeah, um, um, move to some place um, um, arbitrarily close to the origin. And that is the zero point. So the question is uh, whether we have uh, expressed the behavior after zero point. And if not, uh, the, the next second question is how we can specify the behavior of the trajectory after zero point. Uh, so this is uh, of interest of uh, many people in this area. So our current solution is like this. Um, <coughs> so as you know, in the, in the previous uh, um, graphics, the um, x-axis, the horizontal <laughs> axis was ht prime, and the vertical, vertical axis was ht. So yeah, as a specification, you can say that 
if the ht and ht prime uh, reaches zero simultaneously, yeah, then uh, you can say that the value of ht after that zero point should be zero, always zero. Yeah. So you can say something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But currently, uh, and the Avahidra implementation uh, cannot compute this. Yeah. But as a specification, you can write something like that. Okay. So that's the current status. So and we are still working on this. Yeah. And there is a hope uh, that uh, we can make this computable uh, in the symbolic setting. Okay. But this is uh, 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 one of the topics of future study. Okay. <coughs> The, maybe the idea is that in this simple setting, it is possible to uh, compute a sort of invariant of each uh, repetitive procedure. And once we can identify the invariant of this uh, uh, behavior, then uh, we can uh, simulate the program uh, infinitely many steps until it um, uh, reaches the uh, zero point. So that's the basic idea. Okay, so we have uh, 15 more minutes. So uh, let's quickly review the execution algorithms and the uh, our simulator. So our simulator is called Hiragi uh, after some name of some Japanese tree, and it's written in C++ country. And and as a um, computer algebra engine with Mathematica, we used to use uh, reduce and Mathematica, but uh, now we are focusing on Mathematica. And, but we don't use this as a black box, uh, because uh, Mathematica as a black box computer algebra solver uh, has a very, very limited uh, yeah, and solving capability. And also, we, um, maybe there be, should be very few people who use Mathematica in, in this way. So in the uh, past several years, we. Uh, found at least two bugs in the Mathematica, and we reported these bugs in uh, Wolfram. Okay. So that's how we use Mathematica. And also, uh, we are starting to incorporate some interval techniques, and uh, we use uh, the KB, li KB library uh, developed by our colleague, uh, Professor Kashiwagi, and which uses some affine uh, arithmetic, uh, which is very uh, 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 <coughs> close to the, in the uh, constraint idea, uh, symbolic constraint idea. And also, uh, so we don't uh, make so many optimizations, but is the, uh, we need to uh, solve uh, many consistency problems. And we have, if we have many um, variables with many hierarchies, then there are uh, maybe exponentially many combinations, possible combination of constraints. So we need to uh, exploit the uh, locality of constraints and the uh, existence or absence of changes of a set of constraints. So we, need, uh, we have made some constraint uh, optimizations uh, in order to reduce the number of uh, consistency checking. Okay. So now, uh, as a result, uh, we need to, uh, we are able to solve some uh, uh, um, parametric uh, for, uh, <coughs> uh, hybrid systems. So here are some, uh, a list of some uh, rigorous tools of hybrid systems, Akimen uh, by Professor Taha, and the Froster, uh, which is basically a theorem model, and some uh, um, Verification tool, tool for D Rich and D Liao, and SpaceX, Chimera, Hiragi. So, um, but uh, our technique uses some symbolic technique uh, and some affine arithmetic, and inside it, uh, we need some interval techniques like interval Newton. So, we are now starting to combine um, both symbolic and numeric technique. But uh, the basic idea is that interval techniques and affine uh, arithmetic are can be interpreted as uh, constraint technology. Yeah, that's how uh, we uh, are going to incorporate these uh, interval techniques in this, our symbolic setting. So uh, maybe uh, this is basic algorithm. 
So basically, uh, we first compute the uh, partially ordered set of constraints. So actually, the uh, computation just alternate between the point phase uh, for changes and the interval phase for continuous evolution. But, uh, but each of these uh, point phase and interval phase, there is some non-determinism. Uh, because, uh, <coughs> so for example, uh, in the interval phase, suppose that we maybe uh, toss a ball yeah, in this room, then the ball may first uh, hit the ceiling or maybe on the wall, on, on the floor. And depending on how we, yeah, uh, how I toss the ball. So basically, yeah, <coughs> uh, if you have uh, some parameters in the initial value of your ball, then yeah, what may happen first depends on the parameter values. So, so basically, uh, <coughs> uh, so when we uh, solve the ODE and the compute the, um, so in the case of an interval uh, phase, uh, we first um, compute the deductive closure. So we just unload all conditional constraints. And then uh, also we find, uh, solve the ODE. And after that, uh, we try to find what will happen next. But this depends on the parameter values. <coughs> so that's uh, when and how the uh, solution of this phase uh, splits. And if it splits, then um, suppose that we have three cases, then, then uh, um, we keep all these three cases and we add some uh, parameter constraints. So this happens if the parameter value is uh, more than one, and this happens if the parameter value is exactly one, or something like that. So, and so we uh, strengthen each case with the parameter values, and we uh, split the split, split, and then uh, resume computation. Uh, if we have some unique uh, choice of uh, <coughs> cases. So that's, uh, so, so I mean, and this loop uh, is about the case splitting. And, and this case uh, uh, happens when the constraints are not consistent. And if you have a unique solution, then computation just iterates. So this is the basic idea. Also, um, <coughs> so anyway, uh, in the point phase and the interval phase, we uh, um, um, calculate uh, deductive closure until uh, it reaches a fixed point. Okay, and also the interval phase, uh, we need to compute the next jump time, and which is minimal with the following four cases. One case is that uh, some uh, conditional constraints, some, some guard or some condition of the rule uh, becomes effective. And uh, this is the other way. Uh, some uh, conditional constraints becomes not effective because, uh, so, uh, because uh, something just ceases to fold. And also uh, because we uh, take the maximally consistent subset of constraints. So at some time, uh, some constraint which has been ruled out may become consistent with uh, other constraints and it becomes effective. And, and in some case, uh, some of the constraints uh, becomes uh, not consistent. So this means that the maximal consistent set of uh, constraints uh, changes. So we check uh, all these four uh, possibilities and compute the earliest possible uh, time at which each of these uh, happens. And it again depends on the value of parameters. So in that case, we need some parameter uh, constraints to the constant store so that we can split um, qualitatively different cases. So this is the basic idea. So uh, maybe we have uh, um, five more minutes. So, so this is one of the successful cases. Actually, um, bouncing ball uh, with some hole is a bit complicated, but uh, they <coughs> either succeeded in, um, so they suppose that there is some uh, bouncing ball and this is the hole, and we change the value of the initial velocity. Okay, and then uh, Hidora just 
uh, succeeded in uh, splitting many, many cases like this. And each case comes with some parameter constant like this. The initial horizontal velocity is, if the initial horizontal velocity is between this and this, then this trajectory happens. And then this may happen, or this may happen, or this may happen, or this may happen, or this may happen. So this is all automatic. Yeah. But, uh, but anyway, the uh, case splitting is a very, very uh, complicated process. So uh, if you have only one parameter, then uh, it's um, sort of OK. But if you have two or more parameters, the things are much more complicated. So there's less and less chance that the symbolic solver is able to solve all the combination of parameter values. Yeah. So it is a very, very uh, challenging problem. So let me uh, uh, <coughs> uh, conclude this talk uh, by introduce some uh, interesting example uh, uh, given by Professor Edward Lee. And, and this uh, paper, Constructing Models of District and F Continuous Physical Phenomena, is a very, very interesting paper, which includes a bunch of e interesting examples. Uh, and many of examples are just about collisions and frictions. So let me uh, um, briefly explain what we can do in these examples. Actually, a simultaneous collision is a very, very uh, uh, delicate uh, uh, thing. Because usually, the physics textbook uh, uh, explains only about uh, the collision between two bodies. But here, the, at, uh, if the ball hit here, then the uh, simultaneous collision happens. So that, and actually, the things are worse if uh, the uh, two balls hit the one ball at the same time. And it, it, even worse things happen if the mass of this and the mass of this are different. Okay. <coughs> so let me um, just demonstrate at least one thing. Uh, factorial. Oh. So, um, so this is a program uh, of the first example. See, the first ball is uh, at zero, and second ball is at uh, the place five, and the third ball is about is place six. But uh, we know that in our uh, textbook knowledge about collision uh, doesn't apply to uh, multiple collision. So uh, we use a symbolic parameter, ips. Yeah. Yeah. And whose value is uh, strictly larger than zero, but it can be very small. Okay. And then uh, initial speed at zero. And then, oh, so the initial velocity of x1 is one, and others are just stopping. Okay. And the, uh, okay. And context. And this means that all uh, balls are stopping. And then this is a collision equation. And then uh, the collision has higher priority uh, than the uh, constant motion uh, constraints. So this is the basic idea. So let me uh, simulate this program. Oh, sorry. Uh. So, uh, okay, so a good, so actually, uh, Hydra succeeded something. And um, a good news is that the, the epsilon is a symbolic parameter. So, we don't use any specific value like 0 0.001 something. Yeah. So, the value of uh, <coughs> eps is anything greater than zero and less than something. Okay. So actually, um, let me review this. And then, then this tells you something like this. So the value of, uh, the initially, the ball x1 is moving. So and then uh, after that, sorry. The value uh, initially the the ball is 
um, moving, then collision happens at time four, and then uh, then uh, the ball x two is moving here uh, uh, at a very short duration of time for between four and four plus some parametric value here. And after that, the second collision happens. And then finally, the um, ball one is stopping, and ball two is stopping, and ball three is moving. Okay. And then uh, we have another uh, option, very experimental option, that uh, to take the limit of this velocity. So uh, the, the, uh, with this option, uh, <coughs> we, let me run this program again. And then now uh, uh, the program, the, the, that option tries to find the variable ifs uh, and, uh, and takes the limit of all these family of trajectories. So, so finally, uh, uh, in this simulation, after uh, some time, the, the ball three is moving and others are stopping. And uh, these are the uh, limit of all the variables when the uh, value of Fs, EPS, is uh, infinitesimally very small. Okay, and there are some examples, but now it's uh, 11.30, uh, so 12.30. So I think uh, I need to conclude uh, my talk. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so some questions? Yes. A collision function. Yeah. It's just the exchange of velocity. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so uh, you specify the uh, ODEs for yeah. the equations, but yeah. then the solution is you. So does Mathematica, is that responsible for getting the solutions for the ODEs? Yeah, you're right. Currently, yes. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. then can you have more complicated ODEs? So instead of constant functions, like Okay, so the, as long as mathematics is able to solve, yeah, the, the current hydra can handle it. So in case where we don't have any ODEs, then uh, the plan is to approximate ODEs using some uh, solvable ODEs with some uh, parameters. So if you have some, uh, so I mean, uh, so we know that linear ODEs can be solved. So if you have some nonlinear ODE which cannot be solved, then we can just um, enclose that nonlinear uh, uh, function using two linear functions or two linear ODs yeah, by using additional parameter which encloses yeah, the yeah, original program. Yeah. That's the basic idea. That's, but that's uh, the, some uh, ongoing work yeah, of us. Yeah. So, but you know, we found that the solving uh, and jumps or solving discrete, discrete changes, it's much uh, uh, problematic rather than solving all these. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, the limitation comes uh, much earlier in solving. So even if we have a solvable all these, the solving uh, changes is uh, much more challenging for uh, uh, the current solvers. Yeah. That's why when we first tackled some interval techniques for uh, yeah, uh, jumps first. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if equations or yeah. solution of equations are infinite, how would it handle it? Like uh, sorry, uh, equations of solutions are solutions of equations or infinite solutions. Infinite number of solutions or yeah. Uh, how so would it handle it? Like if, if you just give some examples or. Uh, okay. Uh, so basically, uh, we handle uh, in some sense. Uh, the our assumption is that yeah, the ODE is some closed form solutions with some parameters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if the, of course the, it uh, represents an infinitely many, yeah, a family of infinitely many solutions. Yeah. yeah. So and, and and so anyway, anyway, this is a very very uh, strong limitation. But there we are still working on yeah that class of ODEs. Yeah.
Any other questions? I have a small yeah. question. Uh, you must have had some experience using uh, uh, Hitler for teaching. Teaching? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Not okay. yet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so unlike you. <laughs> it, it'll be it'll be really interesting to see uh, yeah. the experience with feedback from students. Okay. So actually, internally we use it. Yeah. But yeah, uh, it is very challenging. Yeah. Because uh, we found that uh, writing uh, models or writing specification is not much easier than writing programs, as in any other uh, programming models. Yeah, that's one reason. And other reason is that uh, some discrete part, like case splitting, is very, very challenging for uh, computer algebra systems. Yeah. So, uh, so after coming here, I found a number of problems, yeah, actually, <laughs> which I haven't explained to you. Yeah. But you have, uh, yeah. you, you think about that in the future, that at some point this will be, uh, this is something that you're interested in. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yeah, because in, I want to keep the, yeah, theoretical foundation as simple as possible. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Already the tool looks very attractive yeah. as, a, as a user. Yeah, so I yeah. Hope yeah. That, for uh, very simple cases, yeah. 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 But, okay. but, uh, the, but some complex combination of simple cases yeah, uh, is a very challenging, yeah for both programmers and implementations. So you would it's like surprising. to make it yeah. easier yeah. for the yeah. more advanced cases yeah. before using it uh, yeah. in teaching. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That sounds great. Any other questions? All right. Yes. Oh, kind of like a design question. So, yeah. so you're running a web server right now. So it's yeah. Hitler is running on the web server. And so all you're doing is you send it the program, then it runs it, and it gets this out, the text output. Oh, okay, so there's one uh, Hitler server uh, on the web, uh, which is already available. Yeah, but in this demonstration, I use uh, some local server. Yeah, here. Yeah, so yeah, we use a web interface, but I just um, activated the local mathematical uh, server here. Okay. Yeah. And then, so how does the defining work? You say you sample the parameters, yeah. and then you get the individual simulations. So is that run on the server, or is that run locally? Okay. Uh, so the thing is that the server just computes a symbolic solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even if yeah, uh, you see uh, a family of trajectories. It is it comes from the single solution. Yeah, yeah. After getting single solution, just the web interface, the viewer that just yeah, yeah, yes, and instantiates this yeah as many uh, trajectories as possible mm -hmm. uh, as you like. So will you send the link to the web server to yeah, the mailing it's, it's list? Yeah, you can just Google web server. Ah, that's great. great. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. It's already yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And please yeah, send us bug reports. There are, can be many, many bugs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is homework to find yeah, yeah. a bug. <laughs> yeah. so even a very simple program yeah, may or may not be solved yeah, by Hydro. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much, Professor Weida. Thank you. We also, since this is the last talk in your series, we also would like to present okay. a small okay. gift. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>